Okay, so this is a quick overview um, of some of the basic concepts we'll be grappling with this semester as we explore the Crusades, um, laying a foundation for some of the articles that we will be reading for this week, as well as touching on some of the concepts that we'll continue to examine moving forward throughout the semester. So the first question you sort of ask when you embark upon this scholarly investigation is, what is a crusade? Um, and that's actually a lot more complicated when we start to really consider that term in its medieval um, origin. So um, one of the problems is that the modern application is so distorted. You'll find crusade used sort of casually um, in reference to sort of any um, movement, particularly a movement with a moral component, but um, in most instances, they've sort of uh, taken away the religious element, which as I think we'll um, discuss is really central to what a crusade was. And if you know the true meaning of crusades, um, that it was a sort of a war led by Western European Christians against um, non-Christians, you can appreciate that it's a really charged term that shouldn't be used lightly. So the problem for scholars beyond just that modern distortion is that there is not initially a medieval equivalent. So if you're reading texts, as we will, that talk about some of the earliest sort of movements um, to the Middle East for the purpose of military conquest with this element of spiritual redemption, they don't ever use the word crusade. Um, I'll talk about what they did use, but that's not ever employed in the um, contemporary documentation. Um, it emerges over the course of time, and it starts out as sort of this general concept connected to pilgrimage, um, which was sort of a deeply entrenched practice in um, medieval Christian Christianity. They referenced, uh, they used terms like Iter Peregrinatio, those are the Latin expeditio. So um, pilgrimage was very common and it was very sort of uh, formal and it was a well-developed practice. So for example, if you committed a sin and then you confessed, um, your confessor would assign you penance and perhaps that penance involved a journey to a religious destination, say uh, Canterbury or Compostela or Chartres or Rome. Um, it was supposed to be arduous, it was supposed to be difficult, it was supposed to be contemplative, but once you fulfilled that vow, um, those sins were remitted, they were removed. So there is this knowledge of pilgrimage that's already pervasive in medieval theology, and what they do is they sort of build on that. But initially, it's not connected to a specific place. Uh, you could take a pilgrimage to lots of different places. And initially, there's no opponent, right? And maybe like the devil. But there's no sort of clear um, human opponent, which is going to evolve gradually. So, um, and this is just to kind of give you a sense of um, how pervasive this notion of pilgrimage was. So this is a manuscript um, produced by Matthew Paris, who was a monk um, in the monastery of St. Albans. Um, and he had uh, illustrated his discussion of pilgrim sites and um, including uh, several around Jerusalem, uh, the Holy Sepulchre, which is in the center of Jerusalem. Um, and so this sort of reflects how common this was. Matthew Paris himself, as far as we know, entered his monastery at about the age of five or six and he never left. But pilgrimage was so common that when people would come and stay at the monastery, which was quite frequent, there were no hotels or motels, so you stayed at a monastic institution if you were traveling, they would um, tell him about their travels. And he knew so much detail that he was actually able to fairly accurately recreate a lot of these places. So over the course of the 13th century, so um, conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, so we're talking about at least 100 years into um, this phenomenon, you do start to have sort of a more specific um, apparatus in terms of the process and the terminology. And so we see creep into the sources um, some terms that come closer to what we think of when we think of crusade. So quasad, uh, French, meant way of the cross. You also see people sort of referencing um, Pren la Croix, so I took the cross. Um, and the Latin Cruz Ignatus is one signed by the cross. And so what this really was sort of referencing is um, once you pledged, uh, vowed to go on crusade, 
that sort of becomes a very formal moment. A lot of the times, especially with um, more elite members of society, it was sort of a big public spectacle in a church. You would kneel, you would take your vow, there would be a priest or a bishop who would sort of sign off on it. And once you took that vow, you were able to wear the, the mark of the cross, which signified outwardly that you'd become a crusader. Um, and as the, the um, phenomena evolves, there are also a lot of privileges that go with being a crusader. So while you're on crusade, you don't have to pay taxes. No one can attack your lands. So it was also, it wasn't just sort of this spiritual um, uh, illustration of what you're about to do. It also had a practical element. So um, part of the reason why it's so important to understand what a crusade is is that if we're gonna go back and study it, we need to know where to focus our investigation. And um, in part because um, of that lack of a medieval equivalent, that they're not really defining it, it becomes a very contentious topic for historians. And so um, there's this very, very long developed historiography associated with crusade studies. So um, in order to study it, you need to sort of impose these categories. Um, there is this general notion that this is sort of an unprecedented movement that emerges in the 11th century, and it's couched within this wider context of spiritual reform and social reform. Um, it's also, in many ways, a response to things that are happening in the Middle East. Um, and as though it builds on this tradition of pilgrimage, it's different enough that it's recognizable as something new. Um, the understanding of it, and particularly the um, sort of questions like motivation, questions like, um, if, which, which we don't do anymore now, but um, should we admire these crusaders or should we be critiquing these crusaders? That also sort of changes over time, in part because it's so excessively politicized. And I'll talk about sort of a few different moments in time um, with the historiography that illustrates that. Um, and then the other issue that's sort of a, it has changed more recently, but for a really long time, the only sort of point of view that we had was a Western point of view. Most crusade scholarship was written by scholars from the West, from uh, Europe, from the United States, and it very much looked at it from the point of view of the crusaders um, rather than from the point of view of uh, people who were living in the Latin East, um, uh, people who were practicing Islam, and so that sort of dictated to a lot of how we understood the phenomena. This is a, a shot of um, an early text, one of the earliest phrases in the, phases in the historiography. So some of you may be familiar with Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe. This is during a romantic period, particularly in England, but also in France, when crusaders were very much sort of glamorized as sort of the ultimate, um, uh, the ultimate embodiment of chivalry and all that is good in the world. So obviously putting a very positive spin um, on the crusade movement that later scholars have then sort of backed off a little bit. So as I said, um, for example, you have someone like Sir Walter Scott who sort of presents this very uh, glamorous view of the crusades and of a crusader. In France, there are different periods when, um, because a lot of the most high, high profile crusaders were from France, um, so several kings of France lead several crusades, and so it becomes sort of associated with French national identity um, as a way to sort of harken back, I guess, to sort of the glory days um, when France had this more international presence. Another sort of period in the historiography happens actually at two different times, but they both sort of um, really uh, connect to the religious element of the Crusades. So during the Reformation in the early modern period, you know, the emergence of Protestantism. And so Protestants look at the Crusades as like the ultimate manifestation of everything that is wrong with the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, they use it sort of in their war against each other um, to sort of point to, to the problems. Um, in the Enlightenment, and those of you who are familiar with the Enlightenment, is very much sort of a rejection of religion, sort of more generally. And so they also point to it as this example of how religion corrupts and how religion can result in bad things. Um, and so for them, it's not a particular religious group over another. It's just all religion bad. Therefore, anything like the Crusades that um, is motivated by religion is bad. A little bit later on, you see instances 
particularly after World War I and World War II, when the Ottoman Empire is dismantled and some of these Western powers, uh, Germany and France, but also England, move into the Middle East, um, they actually will say things like, uh, there's a general, I want to say he's an English general, who enters Jerusalem and he sort of brings up the crusade. So like, this is just like 1099, we're conquering it all over again. Um, and so obviously they're putting sort of a positive uh, spin on it. But then as you move past World War II with the dismantling of colonial empires um, and establishment of sort of independent governments in the region, we start to see a turn. Um, the critique of colonialism generally is also applied to what's going on in the region. Um, and people start to see the Crusaders as motivated more by sort of secular reasons. Um, whether or not this is a colonial society is something that we'll be sort of investigating as we move forward. But it definitely becomes another example of sort of this Western power that moved into a region and felt completely justified in subjugating the local population based on beliefs about race and religion. So um, when we look at the scholarship on the Crusades, there's sort of a, a few different camps, and we're just going to talk about two. The first and um, the one that's been around longer are called traditionalists. And they look at all of these different things that happened in Western Europe between the 11th century and say the 15th century and they say okay we are only going to consider large masses of um, individuals who are going to the near east especially jerusalem sometimes they don't get to jerusalem but that's their original destination motivated by secular reasons primarily conquest um, between 1097 and 1291 as crusades Things that happen after, we're not going to include in sort of our investigation. And they really do, again, focus on moments when you have these large-scale expeditions. So, for example, we're going to be talking about the First Crusade. Um, the army set out in uh, 1098. Before those large-scale armies, you actually have sort of mass movements of people. They're not sort of included in this investigation by traditionalists because the people involved don't meet the criteria. So the first crusade is that um, large scale uh, military expedition led primarily by knights and nobles. There are up to nine crusades, depending on who's counting. They also don't include in that sort of um, grouping these smaller scale individual crusades. So, for example, in 1101. Just a few years after the First Crusade, there's a much smaller but still significant movement of individuals who go towards Jerusalem to sort of support uh, and help out. And obviously, they don't get a number. They're just the Crusade of 1101. So as this map sort of demonstrates, the traditionalists very much focus on these large-scale expeditions between 1097 and really 1291, and their destination has to be Jerusalem. More recently, another group of scholars has emerged that says, you know what, that actually is only a part of the picture. And we call these um, scholars pluralists. So they're not so interested in the destination. They're more interested in the process and the organization and especially who initiates it. So there are a number of large um, military expedition, expeditions initiated by the Pope. And so they have this sort of religious trapping about them. And usually the Pope will promise salvation in return for participation. Um, and so the individuals take vows, they're crusaders. These are in a lot of instances um, not towards Jerusalem. So this is one example. They go up to the Baltics around the Baltic Sea because there's still pockets of pagans living up there in the um, 11th and 12th century. You also have um, large movements of people to Iberia, modern day Spain, where there's a significant Muslim presence well until the 12th century. Um, and then at one point you have the Pope call um, armies to come into southern France and they actually target um, people who are French, people who would have identified as Christian, but they don't adhere to the same beliefs as the Catholic Church. So the Pope declares them heretics um, and sends in armies to wipe them out. 
So the pluralists say it doesn't have to be Jerusalem as long as it sort of conforms to this pattern of initiation, organization, and papal proclamation, you call it a crusade. So in terms of sources, um, this is actually a, an excellent example of a literary source that you're probably going to run into quite a bit. Um, it's a very well-known uh, history of um, the area around Jerusalem from the First Crusade well until the 1200s, and it's by William of Tyre. Um, and the, the English title are, is The History of the Deeds Done Beyond the Sea. Um, and this particular illustration has William in it, and it's when he meets, um, or not when he meets, so William of Tyre is the Archbishop of Tyre, which is in around Jerusalem, and he is the tutor to Baldwin IV. Um, and Baldwin IV is the infamous um, king of Jerusalem who was a known leper. And so this is an illustration of the moment that's described in the text of when William first suspects that Baldwin might in fact have contracted leprosy. This is an extraordinarily detailed text. It gives us all kinds of information that we can't find anywhere else. The problem is it's the only history for the region for about a hundred year period. So it is impossible to corroborate it with other literary sources. So we have to navigate it very carefully. Um, uh, and sources generally, these written sources, and there are a number of them, many of them are um, ecclesiastically authored, so archbishops, bishops, people within the church, they have a very particular view of the Crusades. These, are, these tend to be very polemical treatises. Um, they're all in support of the Crusades, though sometimes are very critical of the actual Crusaders. Um, so again, we have to sort of navigate these carefully. They tend to depict non-Christians, non-Franks in a very negative fashion. Um, and in terms of accuracy, very few, if any, there may be one, the Gastafrancorum, that was written by someone who was an eyewitness um, and the Chronicle of Fulcher of Sharp. But the rest of them are further removed from actual events. We don't really know what their source was. Obviously, they're not including citation. Um, and you also have these sort of traditions in medieval writing where you certainly didn't need to acknowledge a source, but also you could use writing that someone else had done, incorporate it into your work verbatim, and it wasn't considered plagiarism. So it was just considered sort of continuing a literary tradition, um, which also makes it difficult for then for us as scholars to sort of determine um, how accurate some of these accounts are. So what we try to do is use other sources to sort of corroborate uh, material sources to the extent that we have them. Um, so for example, archeological um, evidence, like this is Shobak Castle, which uh, you can excavate and they're actually doing some sort of fascinating work on some of these sites. And in, in, in many instances, using the material um, evidence to corroborate or discount textual sources. Um, the other picture here is uh, the cover, it's a Psalter, it's a devotional text that was owned by the Queen of Jerusalem. So you can kind of get a sense of how these um, individuals identified, what was important to them. Um, but obviously you're talking about a region that was controlled by Western powers from 1099 until about mm, 1220. So a lot of these physical remains have been destroyed over time. Very little of the actual written sources exist. Um, and in a lot of instances, even like this Psalter that we think was given to Queen Melisande, we don't know for certain. So scholars have to sort of piece together this puzzle to even try and say, like, this is where I think this came from, this is who I think made this, um, and this is what I think it means. So there's a lot of interpretation that goes into um, understanding the Crusade sources. So our goal in the class um, we are going to conform to a more traditionalist model just in terms of our focus. So looking at primarily the movements of people that go to um, the Middle East um, and also looking at how once they settled, they interacted with the local population as well as the political systems that evolve um, in the form of crusader states. So we will look at who went, why they may have went, uh, where they went, um, and then sort of the impact of that on um, local populations.
We'll also take a look at the evolution of crusading as an ideology, so how it sort of um, changes over time, how it's adjusted or revised, um, as well as what it meant for people who didn't necessarily participate, but were obviously part of this wider phenomena. Maybe their husband went, maybe their son went, um, maybe no one in their family went, and that had sort of repercussions too. And then, as I said before, um, the extent to which we can call this a colonial society. Um, was it a colony? Was it like one of the very first Western colonies? Or does that term just not really suit this time and place? Um, and then what are the short-term and long-term implications of that? So um, we'll sort of look, we'll kind of start in the present and look at um, the history of the Crusades um, in the Paul article and sort of some of the historiography as well as some of the uses of Crusades by different groups. And then we'll sort of track back and pick up the story um, with uh, the call to crusade in 1097.